I've discussed this problem with several people of human rights with internet protocols and the most common response was, well, it's obvious there is no relationship between human rights and internet protocols. It's completely different things. How can it be any connection? The ITF has made a, a big thing of not being a political organization, being an engineering organization. There are quite a few people in the ITF who would prefer not to get into politics. The internet started as a military and academic network with a limited number of users. Therefore, it was implicit that users could trust each other and that they shared the same objectives. This was its foundation. The underlying protocols of the internet, you know, IP, TCP, HTTP, DNS, all of these protocols are enabling protocols that allow you to do whatever you want. And so you see this wonderful flowering of, of innovation, of new, new ways of communicating. The functioning of the internet is dependent upon standards. To build the first connection between computers and have them talk to each other, the Network Control Protocol, NCP, was developed. It was later on replaced by the more efficient Transmission Control Protocol, TCP, which confirms that sent messages are received. On top of that, files are cut into little parts, packets, which allows for more efficient traffic handling. With these two innovations, packet switching and TCP, the modern internet was born. Since the internet is a network made up of other networks, the biggest challenge has been defining open standards that allow these networks to communicate with each other. A vibrant city needs well-engineered infrastructure to keep it growing and running smoothly. That's why we need the Internet Engineering Task Force, a global organization of volunteers collaborating to design standards that provide the infrastructure for innovation on the Internet. It's critically important to have global standards. And one of the reasons the IETF and, and organizations like the IETF are, are important, where it's voluntary, expert-based. The IETF is open. Open participation, open processes, and open standards. It's interesting because the IETF community is very heavily biased towards, you know, white male, middle-class American engineers. Oops. The people who work on these standards are sincerely striving for... Um, doing the right thing technically. And in a sense, they have to do that because if they do the wrong thing technically, it won't work. And so, for the most part, issues of human rights or, or ethics in general are a distraction to them. IETF is not the protocol police. We cannot always control what happens in the world. I remember, I've been in this space dealing with uh, uh, data brokers and third-party surveillers of, of consumers for so many years. Um, like 20 years ago, we brought together a group of data brokers to find out what they're doing and, and how much they know about consumers. And I remember so well that one of their representatives said, Lawrence Lessig said code is law, you know, and, and the code that people write for the internet is determined in large part by what we do in the ITF. 20 years ago, we brought together a group of data brokers to find out what they're doing and, and how much they know about consumers. And I remember so well that one of their representatives said, you know, the secret to our business is not so much how much we know, but just making sure that consumers don't know about it. Just making sure that just consumers, sure that consumers, consumers don't, don't know about it. It soon became clear that the internet was no longer a trusted space. The insecurities inherent in a network based on trust were being increasingly exploited. The internet works because we have machinery that's designed, that is, that implements particular ideas, particular protocols, particular rules about how communications work. And if you do something that violates those rules, your communication won't work. We now need to think what the future internet should look like, what we want to keep, and what we want to leave behind. Technologists, particularly the IET, IETF, you guys are the ones who have, I think, really led the charge. The internet doesn't belong to vendors. The internet doesn't belong to governments. The internet belongs to the user. If you want to do something about this, you probably ought to do it pretty quickly. Um, that's because carnivore is not the only way in which this is going to happen. 
does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? No, sir. It does not. I, sitting at my desk, uh, certainly had the authorities to, to wiretap anyone from you or your accountant to a federal judge to even the president if I had a personal email. This slide shows when each of those services were added to the PRISM program. And this slide shows the kinds of data that NSA have access to. By the end of the 1990s, the FBI had created an internet surveillance system to carry out targeted monitoring of people's email and browsing behavior. It was called Carnivore. It was Carnivore that pushed the IETF to take a position on privacy. A 29-year-old intelligence contractor has revealed himself to be the source that exposed two major U.S. government intelligence gathering programs. The IETF now has a standard on privacy and security. Known as RFC 7258, the standard states that IETF standards already provide mechanisms to protect internet communications and there are guidelines for applying these in protocol design. But those standards generally do not address pervasive monitoring. The confidentiality of protocol metadata, countering traffic analysis, or data minimization. In all cases, there will remain some privacy-relevant information that is inevitably disclosed by protocols. We can set up communications protocols that anyone can use, uh, but if anyone can use them, and by using them you are effectively surveilled, or you can be impersonated, or uh, you can be censored, um, then those pro if those protocols leave those options open, then our society basically is saying we don't, we're okay with those outcomes. If you design the protocols in such a way that they are resistant to surveillance, resistant to censorship, resistant to impersonation, then that's a way of, I think, saying we as a society value these other features. Different uh, tracks in technology might, might result in different implications, like if you choose this path, for the future evolution of the internet, then this is going to affect in this way. If you choose another path, it's going to have a different effect. The ITF does have shared values, for sure. You know, the, 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 uh, the idea of, um, you know, I mean, you, you might hear old timers talk about rough consensus and running code. I would say that they're based on shared values. I wouldn't say that everyone agrees on what those shared values are. Enabling communication, I think, is probably the positive guiding force behind all the stuff we do here. Since day one, the IETF has taken a very strong position on connectivity. The community believes that the goal is connectivity, the tool is the internet protocol, and the intelligence is end-to-end -end rather than hidden in the network. Less than half of the world's population is connected to the internet. Soon, many more people will come online. Will they be able to trust the infrastructure while global interests in the network are growing? What will the Internet of the future look like? I think the importance of Internet is its openness, is the fact, I, as I have said in Spanish, we call it la plaza pública, it's the public space. And it's precisely that public space to mingle, to interact, to relate, what makes it so important. How can we ensure the Internet is an open and free place for both new and existing users? How can we ensure all users can access information and express themselves freely? In the area of freedom of expression, I think that a lot of advocacy groups and politicians and scholars are rightly focusing on the area of content and usage of information. But I fear that what's being missed here is more of the infrastructural area that we sometimes take for granted. We talk maybe more about uh, right to privacy than you know, right to free association and relatively untracked association. I think if you have connectivity, you have freedom of expression pretty much, right? So a lot of the censorship that happens, um, happens by limiting connectivity to what you can connect to. The Syrian uh, internet has just gone down 100%. In Iraq. In Sudan. How is it even possible to cut off an entire country from the internet? 
governments deciding that they're going to cut off internet services to their citizens. They do this for a variety of uh, political reasons. But it's not just happening in um, areas where there are repressive governments. We had an example recently in the United States before a protest was scheduled to happen. Arts action shutting down the internet and phone system at four stations. Nobody but should be able to block the transmission of what you want to express by any technical means. If you added a concept that involved the, the ease of expression, so, connect, so that connectivity is not just about consumption but also expression, then I think you would be there. Content agnosticism suggests that the people who are passing on your message or the parties or the mechanisms that pass on your message are fine with whatever the message is, right? So they're not going to discriminate on the basis of the content of the message. The Iranian government said on Friday that it is to expand what it calls smart filtering of the Internet, a policy of censoring undesirable content on websites without banning them completely as it used to. And this process will continue gradually until the plan is implemented on all networks. That's a very obvious example. It also happens at a less obvious example of infrastructure, areas that are hidden to the public, but nevertheless make decisions about um, freedom of expression. One example of that, and probably the best example that I can say just off the cuff, is what happened to WikiLeaks after the Cablegate incident. WikiLeaks is being blocked by the United States. The company that was providing domain name hosting services called EveryDNS made a decision to stop resolving the domain name WikiLeaks.org into its um, binary address. WikiLeaks is being blocked by the United States. In retaliation for its exposure of information about U.S. policy, WikiLeaks shone a light on war crimes committed by U.S. troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. People of the United States and the world have a right to know what the U.S. government is doing. Still, there is a problem of surveillance. I mean, it's, it's some sort of uh, uh, giving everyone a, a printing press to print paper, but then you, uh, you murder at random some people who distribute the newspaper. But the other thing that I'm missing is the ability to say what you want in private. Last week, The Guardian disclosed perhaps the most sweeping surveillance uh, program that's ever been publicly disclosed. The U.S. National Security Agency had intercepted the communications. As we try to build our technologies to make censorship and monitoring as difficult as we can, or at least make it more expensive to do, the uses of the protocol or abuses of the protocol could, could harm user rights. They develop this tool. They sell it to governments, regardless of if they are going to be using it against journalists, or they're going to be using it against activists, or they're going to be using it against regular citizens. Exactly what we do. If it exposes uh, lots of extra information that makes it easier to censor traffic, for example. Uh, that that's problematic. And so uh, keeping uh, protocol uh, information leakage minimal uh, is important not only for uh, privacy, but also for uh, free expression. I'm not sure how I could write technology that makes censorship harder and uh, makes monitoring harder that doesn't make hate speech easier. Has a definition of freedom of as uh, a technical definition of freedom of expression. Hmm. I'd have to think about it. Freedom of expression through unimpeded connectivity was a founding feature of the internet, and it remains essential for the future development of communication. Help us ensure the internet remains collaborative and decentralized for the benefit of today's users and the users of tomorrow. We need to ensure that rights considerations are part of the future development of Internet protocols. How do you think we can define and protect human rights on a technical level? Tell us how, or even better, join us. <laughs>